Hello everybody, thank you for joining me today and in today's video we're going to be looking at microcytic anemia as part of the haematology edition. So the Medicine Guide is a YouTube channel with free online videos to help support medical students throughout their entire journey of medical school. So I've got videos focusing on how to approach anatomy, CBL, histology, PBL. I've got videos focusing on the high yield topics that crop up in final exams, such as the common ECGs, the common imaging questions, the high yield topics that are found as part of obs and gynae, paediatrics, cardiology, neurology. And this video in conjunction with others will form part of my high yield haematology edition. So without further ado, let's get started. So today's video is focusing upon microcytic anemia. Microcytic anemia presents on a full blood count with a low haemoglobin value and a low MCV. The causes of microcytic anemia is as follows. Thalassemia, anemia of chronic inflammatory disease, iron deficiency anemia, lead poisoning and sideroblastic anemia. So all of the different diseases which are underlined in either red or blue will be covered in today's video. So lead poisoning isn't a topic that's particularly high yield and there isn't a lot of information to cover. So I haven't focused on lead poisoning in today's video. Anemia of chronic inflammatory disease is in a blue font and that's because anemia of chronic inflammatory disease can either present with microcytic anemia or sometimes with normocytic anemia. So with that in mind, let's get started. So the first disease we're going to focus on today is thalassemia. So thalassemia is an autosomal recessive mutation where there is a missing globin chain. So if you have a look at the haemoglobin molecule on the far right hand corner, you can see that the haemoglobin molecule, which is found within red blood cells, consists of two alpha chains and two beta chains. So patients that suffer from alpha thalassemia have a missing alpha chain and patients who suffer from beta thalassemia do so because they have a missing beta chain in their haemoglobin molecule. Okay. So let's look at alpha thalassemia first. So if there's one gene deletion, patients are asymptomatic. And similarly, if there are two gene deletions, again, the patient remains asymptomatic. When there are three gene deletions, the patient will suffer from jaundice and they will suffer from hepatosplenomegaly. If there are four gene deletions, the patient will unfortunately suffer from hydrops fatalis and inevitably there will be death in utero. So now we're going to focus upon beta thalassemia. So like I mentioned previously, beta thalassemia is when there is a missing beta chain in the haemoglobin molecule. So this is something that you do need to know because it is very high yield. So patients can suffer from beta thalassemia minor, or sometimes it's known as beta thalassemia trait. So these patients have got one normal beta chain and one abnormal beta chain. These patients are usually asymptomatic and they have an elevated HPA2. And that's something that you definitely need to know because it crops up in exams. That's why I've highlighted it and underlined it. So just keep that in mind. Patients could also suffer from a beta thalassemia intermedia. So this is a situation where there are two defective genes or one gene deletion and one defective gene. These patients will suffer from jaundice. And finally, there's beta thalassemia major. So this is a homozygous gene deletion. There is elevated HbA2 and elevated HbF. So this is something that's very high yield because you might be given SBA and you might have to differentiate between beta thalassemia minor with beta thalassemia major. So you need to understand that beta thalassemia major presents with high levels of HbA2 and high levels of HbF whereas beta thalassemia minor only presents with elevated HbA2, okay? Beta thalassemia major typically presents in the first year of life with jaundice, hepatosplenomegaly, and failure to thrive. Beta thalassemia commonly affects patients from a Mediterranean ancestry, whereas alpha thalassemia occurs more commonly in patients from an Asian ancestry. 
So that's something else just to keep in mind. So now let's look at the common signs and symptoms that can arise in either beta thalassemia or alpha thalassemia. So we've alluded to this previously, we've mentioned about the spermegaly. And also there are two key features here which are very common in thalassemia. So patients may experience frontal bossing or pronounced malar eminences. So if you have a look at the picture in the bottom right hand corner, hopefully you can appreciate those features. And now let's look at the test investigations. So a full blood count will show microcytic anemia. So this is when there's a low hemoglobin value and a low MCV value. Hemoglobin electrophoresis is diagnostic for globin abnormalities as thalassemia is because there's a defective globin chain. And finally, we can offer DNA testing and that's again looking for genetic abnormalities that are present within the family. Now, another key investigation, which isn't performed routinely, but it does crop up time and time again in SBAs, is to perform a skull X-ray. So a skull X-ray in a patient with thalassemia will be described as having a hair on end appearance on the skull. And hopefully if you have a look at the picture in the bottom right hand corner, you can appreciate that the skull has this hair on end appearance. And just to clarify, the skull x-ray isn't something that's routinely performed in patients with thalassemia, but it is something that crops up again in SBAs. So just be aware that if there is a scenario where a patient's had a skull x-ray and it's described as having a hair on end appearance, that's alluding to the fact that the patient is suffering from thalassemia. Okay. So now we're going to focus on anemia of chronic inflammatory disease. So at the beginning of the video, I stated that it's in a blue font because anemia of chronic inflammatory disease can present as either microcytic anemia or sometimes even as normocytic anemia. So that's why it's in the blue font. So the risk factors of developing this particular type of anemia is that patients might suffer from a chronic inflammatory condition such as rheumatoid arthritis, SLE, inflammatory bowel disease, polymyalgia rheumatica, scleroderma, or the patient might even suffer from a chronic disease such as chronic kidney disease. And in terms of the signs and symptoms, the patient can experience fever, anorexia, night sweats. And then we've got some symptoms which are more specific if they suffer from an autoimmune condition, such as a rash, tender joints, shoulder girdle, and then we've got other symptoms like hepatosplenomegaly and lymphadenopathy if they're suffering from more chronic conditions. And now let's look at the tests needed. So a full blood count is performed and these patients could either present with a microcytic anemia or a normocytic anemia. The serum ferritin is high the transferrin saturation is reduced and the TIBC is reduced. So those three bullet points describing the ferritin, the transferrin and the TIBC are, is something that you do need to know like the back of your hand because you'll often be given an SBA where you'll have to differentiate between anemia of chronic inflammatory disease and iron deficiency anemia and you'll have to use the ferritin, transferrin and TIBC values to do so. So please make sure that you're comfortable in interpreting those values. And the ferritin in anemia of chronic inflammatory disease is elevated because ferritin is an acute phase reactant and it's raised in inflammatory conditions. And in terms of the management, we need to make sure that we're treating the underlying cause, offering a red blood cell transfusion and potentially considering erythropoiesis stimulating agents and supplementary iron. So now let's look at iron deficiency anemia and one of the major, major risk factors of iron deficiency anemia is menorrhagia, and that's very common in premenopausal women. Other risk factors for iron deficiency anemia involves GI bleeding, vegans and vegetarians because they've got very limited sources of iron in their diet, CDAT disease and gastrectomy because unfortunately these patients do suffer from malabsorption. And in terms of the signs and symptoms, 
Patients will experience fatigue, shortness of breath upon exertion, picker. So that's when these patients will have an unusual and abnormal appetite. So patients might eat dirt, they might lick the concrete floor. So again, that's a very unusual appetite to have and, and, and an unusual craving, and that's described as picker. And that usually occurs when patients have a very, very extremely deficient iron diet. So picker is only really seen at the extremes of patients who suffer from iron deficiency anemia. I wouldn't call it a common symptom, but it's something that you need to be aware of. And another symptom that patients might suffer from in iron deficiency anemia involves pallor. Other symptoms which are more high yield involves the description of anglis dermatitis and also glossitis, which is this red beefy tongue. And finally, patients can suffer from cholinicia. And again, that's usually found at the extremes of the iron deficiency anemia. And cholinicia is this description of spoon shaped nails. And hopefully you can appreciate that by looking at the picture in the far left hand corner. So in terms of tests and investigations, we need to perform a full blood count, which will show the presence of hypochromic microcytic anemia. A ferritin value is diagnostic in iron deficiency anemia and it's characteristically low in iron deficiency anemia. The TIBC is high and the transferrin is reduced. So please make sure that you're comfortable in interpreting the ferritin, the TIBC and transferrin in relation to iron deficiency anemia and anemia of chronic inflammatory disease because it is a very high yield question that they do like to throw in in finals. And a blood film will characteristically show target cells and pencil poikilocytes or can be described as pencil poikilocytosis. I don't think you'll be asked to interpret a blood film, but I think the examiners would expect you to be familiar in recognising that target cells and pencil poikilocytes are characteristically found in iron deficiency anemia. So I think it's the case of just being familiar with what types of cells are present in all the different blood films or blood smears for all the different anemias rather than being able to look at a blood film and interpret a blood film. I think it's more important that you're familiar with the terms. We need to consider endoscopy to exclude malignancy in men and postmenopause women who are presenting with unexplained iron deficiency anemia because this might be a sign of malignancy such as colorectal cancer. And Prussian blue staining of a bone marrow biopsy is your gold standard. And in terms of managing these patients, we would offer them initially oral ferrosulfate. And if that was unsuccessful, then we would consider an IV iron replacement. And the last condition we're going to cover today is sideroblastic anemia. So this is when the red blood cells will fail to form a haemoglobin molecule. And this is then deposited in the mitochondria, creating a ring around the nucleus. And this is known as a sideroblast. So the risk factors of sideroblastic anemia is that it might arise in patients suffering from myeloid dysplasia or SLE, and it can arise following the use of anti-TB drugs. Some patients, sideroblastic anemia can be congenital. So in terms of tests, we would need to perform a full blood count, which would show the presence of hypochromic microcytic anemia. Iron studies are elevated in sideroblastic anemia, and the bone marrow studies are your definitive diagnosis, and it shows the presence of ringed sideroblasts. So if you have a look at the picture in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see the presence of these ringed sideroblasts. And the management of sideroblastic anemia is to treat the underlying cause, and to consider pyridoxine or vitamin B6 supplementation. So this marks the end of my video today. If you enjoyed my video, please could I ask you to give me a thumbs up and subscribe to my YouTube channel and to share this video with your friends. Thank you very much for watching my video today and I wish you all the best with your exams.